I actually want to just start with a little video and a, um, a song. I'm going to be talking today about a project called Summer Flowers, which is a, one of our most recent projects in the office. Um, it has to do with the legacy of a writer from South Africa in Botswana, and her name is Bessie Head. She uh, graced our earth from 1935 to 1986, and she has left an incredible legacy of writing and um, storytelling and political activism through her work and her writing. Um, and what we tried to think through in this um, project was how did she contribute to the thinking around land and space. And when we, when we asked the question around Bessie Head's work, we discovered some amazing, an amazingly huge contribution, which I would like to share. Um, although my computer's just given me that wheel of death. Okay, it's gone. Okay. So <laughs> I suppose it's not frozen anymore. So let me just start with um, one thing. <laughs> The white men first came here from over the seas. He looked at his said, This is God's own country. He was mighty well pleased with this land that he found. And he said, I will make him my own piece of ground. Now, many is the battle he still had to fight. And the man is the family who died in the night. As many is the black man who lived all along. All of them wanting their own piece of ground. And one fine day in 1883, gold was discovered in good quantity. Now the country was rich and was richer than land. And each chica wanted his own piece of land. White figures were few and the gold was so deep. Black man was cold cause his labor was cheap. With cruel and a shovel it's all underground. And you said day to tend the ground. Now this land is so rich and it seems strange to me. That the black man whose labor has helped it to be. Cannot enjoy the fruits that are found. He's uprooted and kicked from his own piece of land. Why some people say, now don't you worry. We'll get you a nice piece of reserve territory. But I'll give my love that 10 million can be found. On a miserable 30% of the ground. Yes, some people say, now don't you worry. You can always find jobs in the white man's city, but don't stay too long and don't stay too deep, or you're bound to disturb the white man in his sleep. White men don't sleep long and don't sleep too deep. For your life and possessions, how long will you keep? Cause I've had a rumor that's running around. For the black man's demanding his own piece of ground. His own piece of ground. His own piece of ground. Thank you. Um... That song that you listen to now was a song by Mireya Makeba and um, it resonates very much with the work of Bessie Head and the fact that 
Pesi wrote herself that her main concern is the issue around land and um, how land was lost in especially the southern parts of, of, South Af of, southern parts of Africa. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quite fragmented in the presentation and show um, clips, voices, and um, snippets of the, of the publication that we made because the, um, the actual project itself is quite multidimensional. It is something that we worked over um, over a period of uh, nine months. And it culminated in this graphic that you see on the screen now, which is um, a kind of a broad map of how this project unfolded. And um, it, it, is mean, it is meant to actually think about this project both in its kind of joy and suffering, because it is a kind of a project around suffering, around people, um, you know, a kind of a, a broad suffering of a, a large group of people, a personal suffering through the, through the work of Bessie. And, and if you know any, anything about her history, she, um, she was a person that suffered from mental illness um, and, um, ex, um, you know, being expelled from South, South Africa and then also having to um, survive on, um, on, on a meager kind of writer's salary. But we also wanted to celebrate her contribution towards this big, big conversation around land and, um, and politics of, South, of Southern Africa through looking at two things. The first was her house in Serowe, which, we, which she built in 1969. And the second is her garden, um, her garden around her house, but also a garden that she cultivated with a group of volunteers, um, which became a, a, a communal garden in one of, one of Serowe's um, first communal gardens and started by the Boiteko group. So on the screen, what you see is a, um, a, I would like to call it a map of how this project unfolded, which is a series of plant fragments and photographs and um, small notes and, 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 um, and uh, remnants of our on-site explorations, essentially. What you just saw was a fragment from a film, Come, Come See the Biscope, which was made in the 1990s. And the film is a story about Saul Plyke moving through Southern Africa, documenting what he saw, which was pre predominantly the effects of the 1913 Land Act. And one of the scenes that really resonated with me was the scene where he picks up a flower, places it in his notebook, and describes it as a way of keeping record. And um, for me, it was a kind of a pivotal moment to think through how do we document, document the landscape in a quite a visceral way, in the way that Saul Plyke, um did, you know? And we all know, or, uh, we all know that that document and that notebook became a very important book in South Africa's history, which is Native Life in, Native Life in South Africa. Bessie Head discovered this book quite late in her life, and she says that, that, that this book essentially becomes the missing link in Black people's understanding of the history of South Africa. She was completely moved by it and wrote the foreword for the republication in 1982. Um, so for those who don't know, but the first line of that book has been compared to Kafka's uh, Metamorphosis. And the, the first line of the book of Native Lives is um, something like, um, on, the, on, on, the, on this day, the native um, wakes up as a pariah in his own land. Um, and you can just compare it to the first line of Kafka's uh, Metamorphosis, which um, some people in um, the literary world have done. But 
what we felt like doing or what we thought of doing is to, to perform through this publication a similar act of documenting the land, but in a way, um, through the work of Saw Plyke, through the work of um, Bessie Head, by collecting these fragments, collecting fragments from Bessie Head's house um, and from places of forced removal and um, other sites that begin to talk about this loss of, of space and loss of cultural, um, cultural imagination, the loss of the social imagination, or how do we reinsert the social imagination in these spaces. And we began this process of um, collecting, um, collecting these kind of fragments. On the screen, you see a fragment of, um, oh, sorry, a fragment, part of the, part, part of the, um, part of the flowers that we collected in District Six um, and in, in Hanover Street. And um, and in Kirsten, in close to Kirstenbosch, which is Protea Village. So the lily, for instance, um, or the iris, actually, the iris comes from Protea Village. Hibiscus comes from um, the Protea Parking, which is now one of the parking lots in District 6. And then Hanover Street, or where Hanover Street used to be in District 6, is covered in this kind of weeping love grass which um, I've just found was quite a poetic statement as well in terms of um, combining these two very you know important feelings and naming it after after the plant is essentially another one um, that we found was oh, sorry I'm gonna have to get a little bit more efficient with these screen sharing situation um, but this is this is another one that we found in Hanover Street and photographed in as part of our exhibition um, this one here which is a, a closer look at the at an iris that we found in Papenboom Estate which is close to Woodstock and a um, a Watsonia close to um, close to Kirsten Bosch. And these are all sites which are covered in this very beautiful botanic, botanical landscape, um, but essentially, uh, you know, was the, is the memory of neighborhoods and of, of people, of, of black people that used to be in those spaces and, and share lives together and build neighborhoods together. Incidentally, this one, um, this is not, strictly speaking an iris it's more of a flame lily and we chose at the time we chose this one um, as a um, quite a I mean a lot of the a lot of the choices that we made in the beginning to collect and to compile were aesthetic but in the end it turned out and I'll, I'll share some other stories later about how um, it culminated into the publication and and the and um, and the mural but this one we decided for no reason at the time to put into native life. Um, and um, I'll t explain to you now some of the magic that happened after that, after we did that. So once we, um, once we were kind of happy with all our, um, all our collecting and, and, um, and uh, you know, thinking through and going out, and we were quite a team of people. It was myself, Louise Brookman, uh, Nogobe Gizela, Mkunu, uh, Megan Hotong, my two kids, because it was school holidays at the time. Um, it, was a, it was kind of a day long exercise. Um, uh, Potsula Mola was also part of it, you know. So we, we came together and we just looked at these fragments, you know, and tried to think through and meditate. A lot of the research work and a lot of the thinking is about reflecting and meditating, essentially, you know, thinking through what does this mean? What does it mean when you collect these fragments? place them together, begin to um, uncover the names. Louise was the landscape architect on the team, so she could easily identify some of these fragments that we, that we, um, that we collected. And what does it begin to, 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 to feel like? And it, beca it began to feel to us like a new garden, a new kind of space, a new spatial intervention. Um, and, 
and we obviously decided we're going to have to um, make some kind of a public event around this. And what we then ended up doing is we had a um, event, made this kind of, I don't know, invitation to everybody. We compiled that, um, we compiled a catalog of all the plants that we collected. And we in, made a public invitation. We said, come to the studio, bring a fragment from the, from, from, from the catalog that we made publicly available and contribute to this garden in the name of, or in the kind of thinking through extending the work that of Bessie had. Um, so many people came to the event and we, um, uh, we, we extended the work. The catalog video that I showed you in the beginning was a kind of a way of, um, you know, setting out quite technical information about the plants that we collected and all of that. And in the end, um, you know, so it was it was a kind of a um, um, it is the, the, the thing about um, restoring some of the practices that were lost because of these um, erased landscapes is to begin to restore communal practice again and how do we how do we begin to um, establish some communal practice through research. And one of these things that we like to do is to have a kind of public engagement and public activity and public showing and then a gathering um, and allowing people, a really, allowing really, really people into the, into the research and into the storytelling, but also allowing people to, to extend and to, and to think through with us, what does this all mean? Um, I'm just trying to find an image of how that happened, but one of the things that we did right in the beginning is to hold a um, children's workshop um, around around this um, around around the work of Bessie Head because uh, you know Bessie Head is actually not very well thought of um, or well known. Um, I invited a group of children, including my own. Um, to just begin to make a kind of a, um, a garden on, on the day that Bessie Head would have been born, which was, a, um, or on a day of her passing actually, which is in April. And the children, you know, not knowing much about a, you know, really kind of um, gladly participated in this kind of magical, um, you know, moment to think through. And while the kids are cutting and pasting, you know, um, I, sort of read fragments from a book. Um, I told them who she was and what she did and how, um, how important a legacy is. And, and um, it's a kind of an alternative way of educating, you know, um, rather than sort of a very didactic uh, way of showing, uh, of, of showing children, young children, um, somebody's work, you kind of make them make something while they're learning. So they came up with quite fun things. And also, you know, on the, in the background, um, this research was a commission from um, the Chicago Architecture Biennial. So um, right in the beginning, I did, I did say to the curators that I, I don't know what we're going to be doing for you guys in Chicago in September. I don't know what it's going to be, but I, trust me, there will be something. Um, so there needed to be some design intervention for a Biennale setup. And working with the children, working with the collecting and thinking through was a way of designing actually to, to think through what is this intervention going to be and how does one make it um, accessible to a wider public and how do, you, how do you engage with it through your own practice of, of spatial making and, make, and, 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 and developing your own sense of, of aesthetic and all of that. And I must say the children actually taught us a few lessons in design and graphic design and thinking through what one can do with, with, um, with, with anything actually. Um, and at the same time, our, our gift was to sort of exchange knowledge about Bessie Head. And one last image from that whole exercise is, um, is, this, is this image this image really became the kind of key, uh, the, the key image, you know, um, Bessie Head standing in a garden and her, her partner and friend, um, Bosele Sienana, in the background. And um, 
essentially the pamphlet of the publication begins to emerge or the form of the publication begins to emerge through an exchange with um, with the young children and with the exchange with collecting and, and obviously you know colleagues in the office and, um, and and how do we then collectively make this thing so we made it a point to go to Serowe, it's Botswana, to go and photograph the house and to make a film. So the, the house features quite strongly in a film that we produced for the biennial. Um, but not just that, we wanted to speak to people that we've been communicating with via email um, before that, um, some pe people from the BCA Trust and get their blessing for this research, you know, and get their blessing to, to kind of extend the work and, um, uh, Fortunately, they were more than happy to endorse this work and to um, participate through exchanging, um, uh, you know, rights to some of the images um, and some of the quotes that we used in the publication and also obviously pointing us to, um, to other resources such as the Kama Museum. The Kama Museum in Sarowe is has got a, um, a kind of a, um, a, a, a setup of Bessie Head's um, writing room where she used to write, and like um, Tom Holzinger actually set up the space where you can visit and imagine being in the space where BC Head would have written, where had written all her novels. The house itself we visited, um, the house is currently being, um, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, um, BC Head's daughter-in-law essentially lives in the house and the, the trust has um, offered to purchase her another house so that they can, um, turn this house into a public building, into a public space with a garden and where people can come and um, attend writing workshops and learn more about, about the work that BC had produced. Um, I needed to also understand the dynamics between the trust and the current owner. And um, it, it's, it's extremely um, collaborative. You know, we found that um, the, the person living in the house, the name is um, Mossad Inyama Mayombela. She's very happy. Um, to to be part of this bigger project, um, you know, um, and um, she um, she had one condition that she'll move, on the condition that she has another house and another plot, and and and, and it's it's a thoughtful kind of relocation, and the trust has definitely um, provided for that. You mentioned that you the design was led through the community engagement, particularly the kids. I find that quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, because it's like, it's very striking and I'm sure you're going to show like the installation view maybe yes. later. But, yes. I mean, like getting there, like were you conscious about the, the materials you limited them to, like to, to begin with? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, yes. Or like, like the glitter for me, like, the glittered paper, like for me, I can imagine like that was more from the kid side. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, we, I mean, I do these workshops with a friend of mine, Frankie Nassimbeni, and um, you know, we always, our main task is to provide the material, you know, and the, and kind of a, a little bit of a prompt as to what we're going to do. But that's basically what we do, you know, we say, I said to the, I, I literally said to the kids, guys, this woman called Bessie Head, she, she was an incredible writer, and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah what are we going to do? <laughs> and they were like, um, so I was like, let's make a garden, um, and these are the materials, and, uh, you know, we're just going to play, you know? And the kids were like, yeah, cool, we can do that. And they made, they made these incredible sunflowers and cabbages and um, little snails, as you saw, and, you know, we provided the material, but how the material was used was to, um, completely they making you know um so definitely like you know a lot, a lot. well you know Say again it's like place making as well yeah yeah exactly exactly so um we drew a lot from the energy of the kids and how are they make which is not a kind of a very you know sometimes you know we we very controlled you know mm. we make and now we do things you know so the kids are, they have no inhibition they have no inhibitions you know and they've got no you know, they don't have any anxieties, you know, so around making art. So, um, so that's, that's kind of what I drew from that. So, um, we've been talking throughout the day about entering things from other gazes and, and, you know, um, 
somebody brought up earlier the idea of the plan and the section and, and, and all these forms of control that we have. Mm. Um, and I think that it is, uh, it's such a celebratory form of agency um, mm. to be able to, I don't know, like use, use mm. mothering as a form of practice in the way that you, in a very serious way, um, yeah. with so much substance also. Yeah, I don't have a choice, Samaya. They're all around me the whole time. <laughs> I know, and I'm, I'm also not romanticizing the struggle of any of it. I love I love my kids, but I'd like I, when I was when we were, when, we were, when they were really small, I had two choices: either I cut myself completely off them and just work like an architect and like a kind of a crazy architect, or I actually make them part of the pro projects, you know, and yeah. in that way, not just uh, become the strict architect and then I go home, I'm a mother, you know, and then you know, yes. your mothering is completely unrelated to your work yeah. and you know and work you know sometimes it's it's just fun you know like sometimes yeah. it's just fun to think of projects about like how can they also help you know they, it was also yeah. june holidays so yeah. they weren't going to school so i'm like okay guys we can't sit around the whole day we're going to go and flower picking and we're yeah. going to press some flowers and we're going to make some stuff so it's 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 a all out and they know this bc8 story now they've been indoctrinated <laughs> so they know everything about bc8 but um i just want to quickly move on to this um this publication um, so this is this is the book which I'm supremely proud of. Um, it is it is maybe like the I think the eighth the eighth version of this publication, the series publication, and the whole pamphlet series has got its own backstory, which I'm sure many of you have probably heard or think or thought about. And 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 but the pamphlet publication was emerged out of for me a crisis around architectural publication you know and the fact that it's so dire in our in our context in fact the south african architect doesn't exist anymore i was on the editorial board for the essay architect for a number of years and it was just such a it wasn't a a, a space where i i was i was um optimistic about transformation um in fact i was quite sad saddened by the kind of slow regression of that magazine and um a lot of other things kicked in and essentially I thought what if what if I just with a few other people come up with a publication that is completely analog that obsesses about one thing and through that one thing other themes emerges you know so um, summer flowers is 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 one of those um, is is emerges out of that kind of backstory along with um previous ones like the Lakshorama one gladiolus um you know alabama which is about one particular story in one particular project and this one is called summer flowers because basie heads um kind of you know main novel or one of the most important novels a question of power was uh, meant to be called summer flowers and the question of power is essentially a document of three things the building of a house the making of the garden and the documentation of her mental um, her mental capacity or incapacities during the writing of that novel she experienced um, what um, i think two mental breakdowns during a lifetime and um, this one is supposedly meant to document one of the major uh, mental breakdowns that she experienced, although it is cast as a fictional, fictional book. I've since um, spoken to. Okay, let me let me let me. I'll, I'll carry on a little bit, but that, but this image you've seen now through the work with the the Kids Art Collective, and um, it's a culmination of um, you know the beginnings of that. Um, on in this in this in this second page of the book, um, you see the the lily that was picked in Pratia Pratia village, and you see a note that I that I made around um, a question that I asked somebody at the Boiteco Gardens where 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 um, when we were in Cerro in Botswana was. I just wanted to ask what are the plants in this photographs that we see, you know? So um, Agnes at the Boiteco Gardens told me that that would be, she would, she would strongly think that it's sweet potatoes, you know? So there was a kind of a 
me carrying this photograph and asking people questions and in that way also begin to further the research. The second page is the initial um, letter that I wrote to the Bessie Head Trust, asking them about the fact that the house, the Bessie Head house, is um, being applied for as a national heritage site. So I found on the internet that there was an application that Bessie Head's house would, um, would should be a national heritage um, site, um, although that was already being applied for in 2006. And I was just wondering who, um, where that process was. And I was kind of introducing myself and, um, you know, sharing my appreciation for particularly the lives of women and, um, and the histories that they bring to, to South Africa. Some of the pressed flower clippings. And then about two, three days later, I receive a letter from Tom Holziger, who is one of the members of the trust giving me some very detailed information about where the application stood which and he said that it was declared a national monument in 2012 already and tom is an important figure because he is he was a, a very good friend of bessie heads and he features in a question of power he features in the book and he told me that that book the only it, it, basically the entire book is true he was there the whole time while it was written and he had one issue with the fact that she called him a Peace Corp um, worker. And he wasn't a Peace Corp worker. He was a, he was a kind of a, a volunteer. And he was, he said, that's the only, the only, um, you know, a slight deviation from the truth that he saw in that book. But then in this letter contains the kind of conversation around um, how to proceed with that work. Um, Remember I, I showed you an image of the lily that we picked, the flame lily. At the time I said that we sort of decided, you know, very arbitrary that this should go into Saul Pleike's book, The Native Life. But later on when we were preparing the, the pressed flower clippings for the exhibition in our office, I decided to pay more attention to what Bessie Head wrote about native life. And this is what she wrote. She goes, Native life does not fail as a book of flaming power and energy, astonishingly crowded with data of the day-to-day -day life of a busy man who assumed great sorrows and great responsibilities, who felt himself fully representative of a silent, oppressed people, and by sheer grandeur of personality, honored that obligation. So when I read this, this phrase, a book of flaming power, it just shook me because that is, you know, that is the book that we chose to put the flame lily in. And um, it was one, it, those are the kinds of, um, you know, connections that gets made quite arbitrary or intuitively that become these quite key moments in the research, you know. Um, and at one point, a, a number of those kinds of, um, you know, other dimensional um, aspects of the project emerged, and um, the, what you see on the screen is it is the it's kind of is the actual you know pressed flame lily um, right next to or right after the, the 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 native life book as you saw before. These fragments become collaged in, and um, you know begins to just tell the story in a kind of poetic and aesthetic way, and um, thinking through. Um, you know, how can one produce a publication that is not purely dependent on text, you know, and text could be, um, you know, inserted into many other things, including these kinds of um, scans of flowers and so on. Incidentally, this little piece of material is from Bessie Head's house, um, where she is now, where, where the house is now. I received a letter from Hotsu Lamola, and in a letter she was just, um, you know, documenting some of the conversations that we had around um, Bessie Head's work with wonderings about um, Robert Sabukwe, and um, we, the two of us, had quite a lot of conversation on the work of Ira Drogov, you know, and how how you do, how do you become the research, or how how does research um, how how does research become just not a, a tool of about knowing, but about making a contribution, you know, and it's not just about, you know, 
finding things out or discovering things, but it's actually about restoring some work as well, restoring some some injustices and 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 kind of you know collecting wisdoms about to intervene. So that is what that is about. Um, and this is a kind of a text that we found that was directly linked to Bessie Head's house and what she felt about it. And um, what she said was it. Um, how can my home be this most priceless, defenseless, most valuable, valueless, most welcoming, forbidding, tread softly, the walls breathe peace, deep, dark, black peace, and the wind don't blow. And I mean, it's, it's an incredible text because it's very descriptive of an inner life that she lived within this house. Um, but it's what it's it's a typical kind of um, contradictory way that she describes the world around her. The middle of the um, of the publication, you see the architectural plan, and um, when I saw this architectural plan, I realized this. I mean, I saw the plan right in the beginning of 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 um of this project and when i when when i started reading the plan i realized that this is going to be an important contribution what you see is a is a very modest house in a way remnants of the kind of rtp houses that we know in south africa um, but the plan is distinctly different from that 51 stroke nine house that we know because basically he um, imagined this house and she she could construct this house from the proceeds of a book when rain clouds gather. Um, so she paid for the house from her writing money and she was assisted by an architect to just, you know, help her with the technical um, layout of the space and to supervise some of the builders. But um, she, she basically commissioned and designed this house herself. And what you see is that this, the house you actually enter from the kitchen you know so you come this is the front door you enter from the kitchen and from the kitchen is where you go into the room on the on the left which is the, um, a bedroom it's essentially a bedroom now but it was a dining room and that is where her son lived um, or sleep slept and this is a bathroom and on the, on the right hand side is her writing room and her sleeping room very modest as i said but when I looked at this house, I realized that this is the kind of house that we all know. You know, this is the way you enter your grandmother's house or the way I entered my grandmother's house is through the kitchen. But the kitchen is normally situated at the back of the house. And um, with Bessie, she just, you know, she didn't have any of those kind of um, qualms about a front room or a, a lounge or any of that. So for her, the entry is very direct into the kitchen. And when I discussed this plan with other friends of mine, they also said, you know, we also kind of, you know, enter our house, into my grand, our grandparents' homes from the kitchen. It's only the priests and the people that you don't know so well that enter through the front door, you know. Um, and for me, um, as an architect, I've never, I don't know, you guys are all architects. I don't know, I've never really seen a house like this. Um, is the kind of first time that I see this and I believe it's quite common now in Botswana to, to build your house like this. And it's something that, you know, as an, as an architect trained in South Africa, you don't recognize the contribution of this kind of, um, you know, direct building of, um, of how to enter. And, and it's, it's kind of very resonant of the way um, Bessie Head was as a person also, you know. So as I said, the book, the, the house is completely subsidized by the proceeds of this, of this book, um, When Rain Clouds Gather, her first novel that um, entered her into the kind of global literary world um, and was published in London and read all over. And um, Bessie Head was, um, an, she wasn't living in exile. She, was, she, she left South Africa because of a failed marriage. That's what, that is what she said. Um, and because of, you know, the way South Africans were being treated, black South Africans were being treated in South Africa, and she found a space in Botswana, but the South African government said, you can leave, but you can never come back. And she lived as a refugee for um, most of the time that she was in Botswana and eventually got citizenship in the 70s, I think. I'm just quickly going to go through these. You get a sense of the publication and the kind of how 
the clippings in into 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 the conversation. Each pamphlet has got a blank page, and the blank page is a kind of a monument to the erasure of of these um, of these spaces and of these um, communal practices that were erased through forced removals. This image is. Um, Brought, was brought to me by um, Zayan Khan, and she she reacted to the catalog and brought this gigantic um, um, capsule um, leaf to to the to the to the conversation, and we just had to had to include it into the into the publication purely because of its drama. I mean, it's just a beautiful fragment of of, of flower. And then the last amazing story is. Um, is this one where one of the things that we did, um, or one of the questions that I that I asked to um, the colleagues working on this is that let's look at Bessie Head's photographs of herself and try and um, complement the her clothing. You know, every time she was photographed, she was wearing a floral um, clothing or dress or shirt or whatever, and try and identify the flowers that that could have actually, um, you know. That could depict her clothing style, and this one, this one, for instance, was uh, identified by Louise as a yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And at the time, you know, these two conversations of identifying the clothing and um, collecting and trying to understand the photograph happened quite independently from each other. And when we came together. I shared the story with Louise that, um, you know, this was, it was told to me that Bessie Head is talking to a fortune teller here um, in District 6. And she was also a journalist for Drum Magazine. So this is pro probably one of those Drum Magazine. Um, uh, she was a, so, sorry, she was working in the Drum office, but she was a journalist for the Golden, the Golden Gate um, uh, newspaper. But Louise said to me, oh yeah, so, sh so what, so she um, she identified this as a yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and these two conversations coming together on one page is quite a magical moment because it is possibly you know conceivable that Bessie is discussing yesterday, today, and tomorrow with this fortune teller um, wearing the shirt that depicts that that exact flower. I wish I can show you the actual um, flower clippings because every time we open it up, we we pressed the, the flowers on um, in between um, telephone books. So we used telephone books to begin the pressing process. And I was very specific about telephone books because you want the weight of people's names to begin to press down these, um, these incredible remnants, you know. So every time we open it, you can still smell the flowers. It's insane, but you can actually smell um, the essence of these of these of these blooms still when you open it, so you can have to just imagine via the zoom sphere what these things smell like. But um, there's a, a very distinct fennel smell, the hibiscus smell, and um, you know the kind of um, very strong smells of the of the other of the other flowers. Um, yeah. And that's, that's essentially, you know, all the people that were involved in this, you know, um, the curators were incredibly um, supportive of this, you know. So, Paula Tevarez, Yesomi Omulo, and Sepake Angiyami, they were incredibly, incredibly supportive because I said to them, look, you know, this is definitely going to be a process, you know. Um, you know, I haven't experienced curators being so generous in their trust and support for projects and also you know really supporting it through the resources that's required for this um so um they were kind of very happy to be fed these fragments every now and then and you know trust that something will come out of, of this process and then the Bessie Head Trust were um you know um, headed by uh, Lelobo Molema, Mary Ledra, Harold Head who is um, Bessie Head's ex-husband and um, Lesedi Kiatewa and Poseles Yanana is still alive. She's in her 80s. She's the woman that's also on the front cover of the publication. And she remembers um, Bessie Head not as a um, writer. She said she never knew Bessie was a writer. She only knew her as a gardener and as a friend, you know. So it's also interesting to think through 
the different perspectives of of um, of these um, of these different conversations that we had. Spoke to a lot of people who had um, who had previous meditations in the work of of BC Head, and the key kind of the key concern for us is that essentially during the time that BC Head was making this house and this garden in 1969. South Africa was undergoing the most brutal forced removals at the same time during that between 1964. I mean, previously we had, you know, the remnants or the, the consequences of the land act, but in the kind of 20th century or late 20th century modernist slum clearance, that was the kind of um, main act of forced removals from district six of Firetown and the Flucht and the Yolo all these, the social engineering and the kind of legacies that we sit with now as special practice, practitioners in, in South Africa kind of occurred at that moment. And at that moment, Bessie and Bosele and, um, you know, Tom and all these guys were imagining a new space of communality through the garden. And that is what we essentially want to firstly tell the story of, but then also begin to um, pay homage to. Um, any questions at this point? I'm going to just show you some slides of um, what in the end happened in um, in um, in the biennial. So we have some prompts in the chat, Ilza. Sorry. Um, no, I said we have some prompts in the chat. Okay. Okay. I'm supposed to look there as well. Ish. No, 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 no. You're not supposed to look there. I'm <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Don't uh, worry. Cool. I'm, I'm just going to ask Zoe, do you want to chat with Ilza um, or should I read your questions? Um, yeah, I think, sorry, my questions mm -hmm. were a bit um, that I, my internet was going out. So maybe I was writing things and then you said something that I mentioned and it was, and it was, um, but I've just mm -hmm. found your um, project really fascinating and, this uh especially this interaction that we have um in person with um with nature and with artifacts and textures and i i just had this vision of like um another one of your workshops maybe using some of the local materials to create a natural material that the children could interact with and i could just see it because i'm come from an arts and textiles background and for so long as a teacher we were using uh, materials which I knew would be thrown away and it's one of the reasons why yeah. I look at biomaterials and I was thinking about how mm. beautiful would that would be for them to be able to create their own materials and and be inspired yeah. about the environment around them um yeah I just I, th I think it's a just a oh, an amazing uh, work yeah. that you've achieved and and just from that one of the last pages with the um with the dress of, of, of um, Bessie that I thought that there's a group called um, the uh, Association of Dress Historians that I think would be oh. really interested. Um, they always look for papers around uh, what people are wearing from different cultures, different regions. Oh, and I think that could be quite maybe mm. uh, for a section of it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, that's an amazing contribution. I'd love to. Can you maybe send me some intro? Yeah, I'll put. I'll put. I put the link in the chat. Um, but yes, I can, and I can always maybe via Maxwell send. send you. Okay. So um, you know, I don't know. You know, for those who are familiar with the biannual kind of setup, it's very like everybody gets their own walkie. You know, mm -hmm. and you got to display something, and it's like, a, what is it going to be? And it's a whole stress, right? And I said to the curators, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, we're not going to, we'll see what comes, but you know, it's essentially what I wanted to do was a space for chilling, like together, you know, like relax and read a book and um, have a conversation, you know, and what that space is going to be like, who knows, right? But um, the material that we, that we got, um, that we collected up until, when we had to produce the design for the space was, you know, the publication, the, the press clippings, and it naturally sort of lend itself to a backdrop, you know, this mural. Um, and um, then we had to think very carefully how we're we going to place the other aspects. So what you see in the image, besides these incredible people that are 
that I'm talking to. So this this is um, some people from the Rewak um, Foundation in Palestine, and we had an incredible moment of just sharing information because they ended up being our neighbors in the, at the biennial with their project called Fifty Flowers, documenting some of the neighborhoods and flower re remnants from the Palestine area. So our work with um, between our work on the kind of Southern African landscape and flower clippings resonated very strongly with what Rewak was doing. Um, and their work was a lot more technological, so you had to scan with a QR card and you get the whole map of where the flowers come from and so on. But we ended up having this great conversation. But our thinking was that, you know, we should just get a couple of couches, have a carpet um, where, you know, we can have exactly this kind of setup that you see in, in, in this photograph. And I asked for, um, for, for earphones that you can listen to Bessie's voice. So uh, on a loop, in, on the earphones, you could hear a 23 minute interview with that Bessie had in 1984 with a woman from Adelaide. And um, I can maybe play some clippings of it late, later, but it's a kind of her, it was very important for me to hear what her voice was like, you know. Um, so the sonic dimension of this project is, is quite strong. Um, on the screen, while you're listening to the Bessie's voice, you can watch a film which is almost the same length of the voice recording um, and in there it's a kind of a document of the house and of the garden and um, going through the archives at the Kama Museum and um, and then um, how did how, how this kind of um, documents the process. We worked with Khalid Shamis who's an incredible video editor on trying to get a kind of a uh, surrealistic landscape um, aspect to to the film footage. Heinrich was the videographer, <laughs> um, so he recorded very beautifully this process, and he's an amazing photographer himself. So the two of us um, spent some time there talking to people. So this, the Summer Flowers film is essentially a a um, non audio film at the moment, um, and it's it's visual. But if you're sitting on the couch paging through the pamphlet, listening to, um, to Bessie's voice, you get a kind of a complete sense of what the project is about. This is a kind of a zoomed out version of what we're seeing in the space. Um, sent to us by the biennial, so you can see the kind of setup there. And on the table here, we try to recreate the kind of idea on pressed flowers and, um, you know, books and, um, uh, you know, the, this is the raw material, the books that we consulted during this process is mainly books by, um, by Bessie Head and um, a few Alice Walker um, anthology, poetry anthologies and um, soap, -like soap like work. Incidentally, what emerged out of this project is that Bessie Head's novels is not at all easily accessible in, in Southern Africa. You can't really buy her books easily you know amazon you can get some of it um, but you know it's 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 very rare to be able to buy the books and one of our strategies was to get the americans to buy it and then basically the whole library got shipped back to us you know so i have all these books as part of a library in our office now to consult and to think through and um to understand you know and, and that was kind of a an agreement that we made with the curators you know so that it becomes a roaming it becomes a kind of a library of her works and it could really essentially be, be anywhere, um, pop up anywhere. 